Good evening, church family. To all of our guests, you're our honored guest tonight. We're so glad to have you with us. Appreciate your kind comments about the lesson this morning. And tonight we're in a series of studies. Actually, it was a requested series on the titles of our Lord. Hadn't thought about it until we began to research it. There are many titles for Jesus in the Bible. And we know that not only do titles identify us, they also define us. So as we look at it, different titles, we're going to know different aspects of our Lord we hadn't thought about before. For instance, the very first one we looked at was Jesus Christ. That's the name that most people know him by. We're baptized, Acts 2.38, in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that that name was not one that the parents gave him? It was one that God gave the parents to give to him. Because his name, Jesus, means Savior. It defines who he is. And Christ is a New Testament form of the Old Testament word Messiah. All through the Old Testament, looking for the Messiah. What does that mean? It means the anointed one. It means the same thing with the Christ, the anointed one. So when you say Jesus Christ, now you realize you're talking about the anointed Savior. The second one we looked at was Son of God. It defines his position in the Godhead. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He is Son of God. He is God the Son. That's his position. But he also, he is God. That means he's deity. And the third one we saw, Son of Man. It's also a title he goes by. He is 100% divine, but also 100% human. And not just human, but raw humanity. He was born in a barn, Raised in Nazareth, had no place to lay his head. In fact, he says that of himself. The Son of Man has not a place to lay his head. He was homeless. So he can relate to all strata of people. The fourth lesson we saw that to be anointed in the Bible, you were either a prophet, a priest, or a king. He's all three. Not just a prophet, he's called the prophet. Not just a high priest or even an Arianic priest. He has his whole ministry of the Arianic priesthood, not of Aaron, but of Melchizedek, a whole different priesthood, all by himself. And he's also the king, but not a king, the king of kings. In our fifth lesson, we really honed in on that one expression. He's also Lord of lords. Lord means master. He's the master of all masters. He must be our master of our lives. Number six, we looked at the idea that he is called the prince of peace. And the whole world's looking for peace. He's the prince of peace. In fact, number seven, he's just called wonderful. In every aspect, he's wonderful. He is the light of the world and the bright and the morning star. We, that lesson was during the time we were having the eclipse. But he is the light of the world, and he's the bright and morning star. He is the consolation of Israel. We are New Testament Israel. He's our consolation. And he is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And last week, Christ identified himself as the way, the truth, and the life. Tonight, we look at two, I think, Marvelous concepts about our Lord. You might have thought about this before, but this really brings it home to us tonight. He is called our advocate and our mediator. That's not talking about being a vegetarian or a meat eater. He's our mediator. Now, what does that mean? It means our advocate is to call alongside. The same word for advocate is also translated in our New Testament. He is our paraclete. Or our comforter. The Holy Spirit is called the same thing. Our comforter, our advocate. But Jesus is also called our advocate. One we call alongside for help. And mediator means a go-between. you listen to our text tonight? Open up again to Job chapter 9. That's a marvelous text. Verses 32 and 33. You remember Job. Job was a righteous man. As the book of Job opens, if you look at how he's defined, you'd wish that was on your tombstone. To be that kind of mind, man, that kind of life he lived. 
And yet the whole world came crashing down on him. Now he doesn't know what's going on. But behind the scenes, Satan is bragging to God, I got the whole world in my pocket. And God says, not quite. You haven't got Job. And he says, well, yeah, because you spoiled him. Gave him all these toys. He's a rich man. Take away his possessions. He'll curse you to your face. And God said, go ahead. But don't touch him. But Satan will go as far as he could. He took not only his physical possessions, he took all of his children too. And yet, Job did not curse God at all. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow, what a man. Next scene, chapter 2, here's Satan again, prancing around heaven, saying, i got the whole world in my pocket. You haven't got Job. Well, because you give him good health, let me touch his health, he'll curse you to your face. He says, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. And Satan went as far as he could. He gave him a living death. I mean, he was just in terrible torment. The boils, listen to what he says here in Job chapter 9. In verse 32, what he's looking for is somebody to represent him before God because his so-called best friends have come to him. For seven days they were silent. That's when they really were his friends. Then he began to speak and all of them accused him of deserving this. And he knew he didn't deserve this. So in verse 32, he's talking about God. For he's not a man, God's not a man, as I am, that I should answer him. I can't even really talk to him on that level because he's not a man. And you'll read later on in Job 38 when he begins God to talk to Job. After Job has gone through all this interrogation, he's asking God, where are you? And then God says, let me ask you, where are you? Where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Oh yeah, you're God and I'm not. So in chapter 40 he says, I'm not God and you're right. But how can we talk to God on that level? For he is not a man as I am. I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment or in a courtroom. We can't do that. Why? Neither is there any days man. There's no lawyer. There's no go-between for us. There's no advocate between me and him that might lay his hand upon both of us and help us get back together. My wife and I, we love the old Perry Mason lawyer shows on me TV and we love Andy Griffith who became Matlock but we love those court shows maybe you like them too but here's the thing today in our world today and it hasn't changed since Job's day in our day if you get in any kind of trouble what's the first thing a person tells you to do get a good lawyer and the more money you can afford the better lawyer the better you are have an accident, got Axelrod, right? I mean, we had it every day. You see it on signs everywhere. Get a good lawyer. Why? Because the better the lawyer, the better the chance you're going to be found innocent. You're going to get what you need. But in Job's day, he's looking for him. Where is he? In 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, John's writing to the New Testament audience he says, little children, I write unto you that you sin not. Now, we're going to sin. That's why he knew. That's why he sent Jesus. He says, but we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he's a propitiation. That's a big word. It means to cover. He's a covering for our sins, but not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. He is our only advocate. Now, when you read about an advocate, another word for a lawyer is, do you have counsel? But the counsel that we read about in the Bible is not talking about his advocacy. It's talking about his communication to us. And God communicates to us every time you open your Bible. You communicate to him every time you pray to him. I want you to open your Bible to Proverbs 12 and verse 15. Proverbs 12 and verse 15. You say, I want, to, uh, I want to hear from God. I want to know what God thinks. Well, read your Bible. In Proverbs 12 and verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. 
a fool in his own eyes, wherever he says, makes sense. He's right. He's clever. He's smart. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise, seeking real counsel. Now turn to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Look at verse 7. Psalm 16 and verse 7. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. That's where you want to go for your counsel, the Lord. My reins or my heart also instructs me in the night seasons. In Psalm 119, the whole chapter of Psalm, that's the largest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses. It's all about the Word of God. In Psalm 119 and verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's what he's saying here. If I hide God's word in my heart, it comes back to me in the night. I remember, I memorize that verse. It gives me strength. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. And the other night when we were there, as J.J. was passing away, it came back to me over and over again. I tried to give it to all the people I could give it to. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. We don't understand. But in all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. That's his counsel. He speaks to us through the word. In Psalm 73 and verse 24, Thou shalt guide me by thy counsel, and afterwards receive me to glory. In Psalm 119 again, verse 105, Thy words a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. I love the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, 13, God says through Jeremiah, You shall seek me and you shall find me. If you search for me with all your heart. In Acts chapter 8, we find a man just like that. We don't know his name. We call him the Ethiopian eunuch. He was from Ethiopia. He had gone to Jerusalem, study under the Judaism there. He was a proselyte. He's on his way back home. He got a, he must be pretty rich. He got a portion of God's word. The prophet Isaiah, he's reading from Isaiah 53. Doesn't understand it. So God sends a man to him, one of the servants in Acts 6, 6, named Philip. Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I, so some man should guide me? I don't understand God's counsel here. I need some help. Philip began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. All the Bible's about Jesus. And when he talked about Jesus, then the Ethiopian eunuch said, well, here's water. What's stop me from being baptized? He says, if you believe, you may. So I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They stopped the chariot. They both went down to the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized, though. He immersed him. He went on his way rejoicing. That's the counsel of God. He learned from God's word how to obey him. And in Romans 10, 17, our very faith comes by hearing the word of God. And Revelation 2 and verse 10, keeping that faith, be thou faithful unto death, you shall receive the crown of life. That's God's counsel. But here, I want you to understand this. When he says he's our advocate, he's not talking about him counseling us. The advocacy of God, of Jesus with God, is pleading for our case. Like a lawyer pleads your case before the judge. That's what he means here. Christ is our advocate. He pleads our case for us. Now, when you go look for a lawyer, I mentioned a moment ago, looking for your bed. I talked to a man one time about a lawyer, and he said, this particular lawyer he was talking to about, he says he knows his way around a courtroom. That's saying he knows what he's doing. You want somebody knowing what they're doing. Well, in John 3, 13, you ever read this verse? Jesus said, only one has come from heaven and to earth, and it's going back to heaven. That's Jesus, right? Where's the courtroom for us one day? In heaven, on judgment day. He knows his way around the courtroom. He came from heaven. Second of all, you want a judge or you want a, a lawyer that the judge listens to. Well, in John eleven forty two, 42, Jesus says, God always hears me. You want him as your advocate. He also understands justice. As much as he wants to plead your case, he also understands God's side. He's also God, you remember. In Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, God's hand is not short and he cannot save or his ear heavy cannot hear. I mean, God can save anybody he wants to. However, 
your sins have separated you between you and your God. And your iniquities have turned his face from you cannot hear. That's our problem. We sin, and so we separate ourselves from God. God wants us back. We want to get back. But how do we do that? He's committed, Christ is, to our case. In Hebrews chapter 10, we have a discussion of the Godhead about the future. They haven't made man yet. But God says when we do make man, we're going to make him in our own image. And when we do, he has a choice, right or wrong. And when he chooses the wrong, he's going to sin. And when he sins, the blood of bulls and goats won't be enough. I need a man. I need a body. I need a God-man. And Christ says, I'll do that. I'll be that advocate. I'll do that. So the plan's in place before he makes the world. Then in Hebrews 2 and verse 17, let's look at that together. Hebrews 2, 17. Of course, the Hebrew book is all about the Old Testament imagery and the New Testament reality. And the Old Testament is all about the high priest. This is what he says here in Hebrews chapter 5. Let's see. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. Hebrews 2, 17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him, Jesus, to be made like unto us brethren, the God-man, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make, here it is, reconciliation. Make us reconcile, be at peace, be at one again. Reconciliation for the sins of the people. Christ wants to make that right between God and man. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4 now, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, the courtroom, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but with all points, tempted like as we, yet without sin. He can go before God and say, I know how tough it is to try to live down there in that world. I know how tough temptation is. He didn't succumb to it, but he knows how tough it is. You want somebody who understands you. He does. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can do that because we have an advocate. Amen? Jesus. Do you see it? But here's the grounds for our defense. I mean, we have no defense. When we sin, we're sinners, folks. Okay? But here's our defense. God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, you and I, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes upon him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He's the ground. John 15, 13, and 14, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for a friend, and you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So it's all about his dying for us, Galatians 3.13, taking away the curse of the law. Because the curse of the law is only satisfied by death on a cross, and he did that. That we might be one with him. Look at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. 5 and verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation until all them that obey him. He's now our advocate. If we obey him, we're right with him. He comes to us, with us, before God the judge. Look at Romans 5 and verse 19. Romans 5 and verse 19. For as by one man, Adam disobedience, many were made sinners. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Now, some teach that means original sin. That's not what he says here. And we know the second part of this verse. But when Adam sinned, sin was in the world, and when we sin, we sin at the similitude or similar to what Adam sinned. We become a sinner in that point. But keep reading. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So by Christ being obedient, does that mean everybody in the world is saved? No. Christ brought salvation. Not everybody is saved. Who's saved? Those that obey. Who are sinners? Those who commit. 
It's our action, one way or the other. When we obey him. Now look at Hebrews 7, verse 25. Hebrews 7 and verse 25. Wherefore, he, Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, by him, Jesus, seeing he, Jesus, ever lives to make intercession for them. That's what makes his day, is interceding for us, advocating for us, getting right with God through him for us. That's the advocate now, what's the mediator? It's a go-between. So now I'll go to Galatians chapter 3. There's similarities here, but also differences. Look at Galatians chapter 3 with me. And look at verse 20 this time. Galatians 3 and verse 20. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one. But God is one. See, when he advocates for us... And now, he advocates for the whole world, we saw, but he does it individually. When he stands for Stephen Guy, he stands for me. When he stands for you, he stands for you. He's, but when he's a mediator, he's between man and God. And a mediator doesn't represent just one side. He represents both sides. Now turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. For there is one God, that's right, and one mediator between God and man. The man? Christ Jesus. He's the man. He's the God man. He's the only one who can mediate for us. So now going back to Romans chapter 5 and in verse 10 we read, For, it, for if when we were enemies... Now, I want you to understand this. When we sin, sometimes we say, well, we made a, a bad decision. We slipped. Okay, I messed up. When we sin, sin is enmity with God. We become his enemy. Okay? When we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled because of that, we shall be saved by his life. His death, burial, and resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, is the gospel. And we obey that in baptism. We now walk in a newness of life because of our mediator. Look at Ephesians 2 and verse 16. Ephesians 2 and verse 16. And that he, Jesus, might reconcile, make us one, now notice this, both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity, there it is again, the enmity thereby. But notice the context here. He's not talking about being a mediator between God and man here. In this context, he's also the mediator between Jew and Gentile. Between you and me. He's the mediator. When we all both come to the Christ, he reconciles us by the cross. He's our mediator. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. To wit, that God was in Christ. God was doing us through Christ reconciling the world unto himself, making the world reconciled to him, not imputing, not counting their trespasses unto them. Because of Christ's blood, he doesn't count that against me anymore. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, we're supposed to go out and help people get to God, reconciling them through the Christ. There are many titles for our Lord, but this is precious. Let me give you an example. This is, now, again, God's trying to talk to us in man's terms so we can understand it. Is this the way it's going to be on Judgment Day? We don't know. But here's the picture he gives us here. 
In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of things we've done in the body, whether good or bad. So here's, here's the picture. It's my turn. As I go before God on judgment day, I look up, and I can't because, I mean, God is just so magnificent. I'm looking down. I hear these words. How do you plea? Guilty as charged. I'm a sinner, condemned, unclean. I look back up, and this time I see the face of Jesus. It's the court of Jesus. I see him get up, take off his robe, and come down and put his arm around me. And now he's talking to God the Father. And he says, that's why we made them in our own image, because we love them. And when they sin, that's why we made the plan to save them. And that's why I came, and someone shared the gospel with Stephen, and he obeyed that gospel. He was baptized into Christ. He's tried to live the Christian life. My blood kept on washing away his sins, 1 John 1, 7 and 9. So how do you see it, God? And God opens up Revelation 20, the book of life, my life, and the Bible, and looks at it and says, well... You have sinned, but it's not in my book anymore. It's been washed away, erased by the blood of Christ. So enter in, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you a ruler over many things. And the joy of your Lord. Enter the joy of your Lord. I almost see him now walking me into those pearly gates. You see that for yourself? Because that's the question of the lesson tonight. He is the advocate for the world, but is he your advocate? Have you put yourself in a position that he is your advocate? Do you have heavenly counsel? Do you have the mediator in your life? Because if you do not obey the gospel, if you're not baptized into Christ, if you've been baptized but fallen away from your first love and you're not with him now, He won't be with you on judgment day. You won't have a lawyer. You won't have an advocate for you. That's like I think Matthew 7 is talking about. They're going to say, Lord, didn't we do many wonderful things in your name? Well, you can say a lot of things about Jesus, do a lot of things in his name. But if you're not in Christ, he says, depart from me. I never knew you. The most important thing about Jesus is, Is he your advocate? Is he your mediator? He died for that purpose. He wants to be. Tonight, will you choose him as your lawyer, as your mediator, as your savior, as your advocate? You have that choice tonight. We're going to stand and sing an invitation song, give you a chance to come down the aisle, be baptized into Christ, have your sins washed away, put him on. Galatians 3, 26, 27 says when you're baptized, put him on. He's on your side. He always has been, always will be. But now he's on your side as your advocate and your mediator. If you've fallen away from him, so young man this morning, Cole came this morning, you can come back tonight because you don't want to stand before God alone. That's why Jesus came. Will you come?